thank you all for coming. Thank you for the invitation to speak. It's a very great pleasure and a huge honor for me uh, to, to speak on, on the occasion of Alain's 60th birthday conference. So uh, I would like to start by uh, saying a few words. So uh, I, I was lucky to meet Alain at the, the beginning of my career and to benefit from uh, his friendship early on. And, and uh, uh, many of uh, Alain's friends, he introduced them to me and they, they became also my friends. Some of them became collaborators. Same thing with Alain's students. And uh, uh, what I'd like to say is that for me, Alain is, is a, a living incarnation of something I discovered uh, about mathematics uh, when I started uh, to do it uh, as my profession is that um, mathematical progress is not only uh, the cumulated endeavors of individuals each working on their own problems uh, isolatedly, but, uh, but uh, mathematical progress is also made of the relationships and the, the friendship that, that mathematicians develop. And uh, I want to thank Alain for uh, showing uh, that very important aspect uh, to me and I think to, to many of us. So, uh, I will, so I will have a few slides as a teaser for my talk and then I will move on to the blackboard. So my talk is also something that uh, is directly related to Alain because it started about six months ago in Neuchâtel when Alain was having a one-day workshop there with a, a, a few talks. And uh, one of the talks was given by uh, Pierre de la Harpe, who uh, says hi, by the way, and uh, of course uh, uh, is associated to this meeting also uh, by, uh, par la pensée. Um, so all, uh, all the, the new results of my talk are joint work with Pierre. And uh, what I'd like to explain is that so uh, on uh, this talk by Pierre was the occasion of uh, a start thinking about basic elementary questions about unitary representations of discrete, discrete groups. And, and we started a small journey. Uh, and then along the way, we, we encountered uh, various surprises, at least for us, and I'd like to share them with you. One of the surprises was an open problem in number theory. And another one was a connection with additive combinatorics. Okay. So another uh, surprise for me uh, was the, the discovery that math, math overflow, uh, apparently it, it existed in the 19th century. <laughs> and uh, let me sh show that to you. So here is a journal called L'Intermédiaire des Mathématiciens. It was published, uh, it started to be published in the 19th century and it was published for 25 years about. Okay, and so if you take this journal and uh, you open volume number 23, published in 1916, so you, you can look at one of the articles there, it's a very short. Okay, and so it's a paper by Mr. Rata, who says, on a 31 égale 5 au carré plus 5 plus 1, égale 2 exposant 4 plus 2 exposant 3, etc. Peut-on trouver d'autres nombres jouissant de cette propriété X et Y étant quelconque. And then in the next volume, the next year, <laughs> so you see another paper published by Mr. Gour Maktai. So it refers to Rata's paper. So it looks for numbers A such that blah, blah, blah. And then Gour Maktai observes that actually there is another solution which is 8,191, which can be written uh, in two different ways, uh, in a, uh, yeah, uh, as requested by Rata. Okay? And he also observes something rather uh, easy, is that uh, uh, so if one allows negative numbers, then, then you have infinitely many solutions. So it's more interesting to focus on positive numbers. And then he's, he claims that uh, uh, up to 100,000, these are the only two solutions. He doesn't say how he checked, uh, <laughs> probably not by using <laughs> the computer. <laughs> <laughs> how, how does one find those references? Uh, 
<laughs> yeah. Because so the internet was so not as well developed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we we discovered them because apparently so the so there is something called the Gurmakhtai conjecture, ah, okay. and that's it's even on Wikipedia. Ah, okay. So so how did I find l'intermédiaire des mathématiciens? So this is thanks to. Uh, very efficient uh, secretaries at the University of G Geneva. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, the Gurmakhtai conjecture asks whether, besides the two solutions found by Gurmakhtai, there are other solutions of this uh, Diophantine equation. Okay. And so uh, we asked, especially Pierre, contacted various friends and colleagues in number theory, and we were told that uh, this is wide open, there are papers. Uh, published nowadays about special cases where you specify maybe the value of m and then you 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 you, you are able to say things but apparently it's it's wide open and and, and way beyond the, the available techniques uh, here I'm repeating what what uh, we were told um, yeah so so here is uh, mr. Gurmaktai so I was guessing from the name that uh, maybe it was a, a, a Scottish gen gentleman, uh, but uh, ap actually, <laughs> 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 so the right pronunciation of his name is Hjor <laughs> 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 and uh, he was a Belgian uh, businessman, uh, an amateur mathematician, he has uh, quite a few mathematical papers, he was also playing the piano in his free time, so he was born in Ostend, uh, and he passed away just two years after Alan's birth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me move on to the next subject I will briefly mention. So, uh, some related to additive combinatorics. So, that's uh, uh, the concept I would like to introduce. So, you take any vector space over a commutative field. Uh, and you take a subset, a se any set of vectors, you want to define the set of directions determined by, by that set F as basically um, all the one-dimensional subspaces uh, spanned by, by uh, differences of two non-distinct non, uh, elements of F, right? So if you think projectively, so these are the points at infinity of the vector space uh, that are collinear with a pair of points inside F. Okay? If it's finite or not? For the definition, I don't uh, uh, need uh, to assume uh, any finiteness, but, but now we will uh, move on to the finite case. So we fix a, a finite field of order Q. We just look at the two-dimensional vector space over Q. Okay? So there are Q plus one, one-dimensional subspaces, Q plus one possible directions. And the question asks for the least size uh, of a set that determines all of the possible directions. Okay, so that's the question. Um, so there are a few easy observations that you can make. So, so there is a clear lower bound on uh, alpha of Q. So a set of size n determines, of course, n choose two at most directions. And so the least n such, such that n choose two is at least Q plus one. Uh, gives you a lower bound for alpha q, and, and you can easily see that uh, the that, that, uh, square root of 2q uh, uh, realizes this. And then there is an upper bound, which is also linear in the square root of q, which is a little bit trickier to establish, but that, that's also possible. So uh, for c can be taken slightly larger than 2, and then it, it works. But, but here, really, here really the, the question really uh, asks for a precise value. You mean it's the same C for all Q? Yes, yes. Uh, this upper bound, yes, but uh, uh, yeah. Okay, and uh, so this is uh, recorded uh, uh, in a list of problems in additive combinatorics published about ten years ago. Okay. So I will uh, leave it there for for the teaser, and now. Um, and now I, I would like to explain so how we encountered uh, those various questions while starting uh, 
thinking about basic questions of, uh, on irreducible uh, unitary representations of groups. So let me set up now the, the notation. So throughout G will be a discrete group. So I will talk about irreducible unitary representations of G and, and it's very convenient to use uh, irrep as an abbreviation for irreducible uh, unitary representation. Okay, and so uh, the theory of unitary representations of, of groups of and especially locally compact groups in general, uh, it started long. It started long ago, and I would like to uh, remind you one of the foundational theorems here. It's a theorem due to Gelfand and Rykov in '43. Uh, it says that any group has enough irreducible representation, then the, the precise formulation is as follows. So for, for every G in G different from the identity, there exists an irrep pi, which is non-trivial on G. Okay, so okay. And uh, what I would like to discuss is uh, kernels of irreducible representations. So this is a, a, set, a set of normal subgroups of G and, and we'd like to uh, obtain information about them. And uh, let me already uh, define the, the notion from my title. So a set F in G will be called irreducibly faithful. Uh, if there exists an irrep pi of G that's non-trivial on every uh, non-trivial element of F. Okay, so, so that's the notion of an irreducibly faithful subset. Okay, so Gelfand Rykov says that every single ton in a group is irreducibly faithful. And then uh, what I learned from Pierre, it's, a, it's a, also a result from the general theory valid for every group. It was proved by Walter in 74. Uh, and Walter proved that in every group, Um, every couple is irreducibly faithful. Okay. So I don't know why I found this, this theorem rather counterintuitive. And uh, so Pierre mentioned that to me, he mentioned that in, in, in this talk I, I, I presented I, I referred to earlier in the Châtel, and uh, what certainly one can point out is that uh, uh, certainly it's not true for triples, right? Because you can take, you know, uh, a very easy group, the, the klein firer group, okay, it has four irreducible representation, and each of them kills one of the, at least one of the uh, involutions in that group. Okay, so, so the triple of involutions in G from the subset that's irreducibly unfaithful. Okay, and so in order to study this notion, we decided to uh, introduce uh, a property. So we say for n an integer, we say a group has property Pn if 
every set f in g of size at most n is irreducibly faithful. Okay. And so the goal for my talk, which was uh, the goal we decided to take for our project, was to uh, describe algebraically the groups with property Pn. Okay, and so th this will uh, this is uh, what uh, uh, I will explain. Wha wha what is the solution that we obtain? So what what how can we algebraically describe such groups? I will not state the main theorem right away. So the but I will only mention one thing. So the main theorem that will come later uh, implies the following. It's a corolla corollary uh, that uh, uh, I want to dedicate to Alain. Uh, is the fact that P of 60 <laughs> implies P of 61. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And clearly, from the definition of Pn, so uh, the, the, the larger n is, so the, the, the stronger is the, the condition. So Pn implies Pn minus 1, of course. Okay, and and uh, this implication is actually one among, among uh, many others. Okay, for example, P of 10 implies P of 11. And then uh, I don't know all of them by heart, I know one which is p of 91 implies p of 97, and so on. The gap is not necessarily one. The gap is not necessarily one. That's why I'm mentioning this. Okay. So there are gaps. And uh, yeah, I would like to uh, explain where these gaps come from. Can we do locally compact groups, not only discrete groups? I mean, you can. Of course, the question is, all makes sense, and uh, and uh, uh, I don't know the answer in the general case, but uh, it's certainly yeah uh, possible. Although the, some of the some of the arguments I use are confined to the discrete case, but uh, some technology is available to deal with a more general yeah. Okay, so it's really for every group. I mean, not not necessarily five. Uh, yeah. Ah, sorry. Uh, this is for countable groups. Yeah. Thank you for pointing. I, I will mention the, the relevance, so G countable, finite or infinite. Okay. Okay. So, so let me, so that's the introduction. Let me now uh, spend some time discussing. Uh, irreducibly faithful groups. Okay, so a good way for a group to satisfy property Pn for any value of n is for g the group to admit a faithful irreducible, irreducible unitary representation. So let's first spend some time uh, understanding that case, which is a, a very classical problem. So, so. The first observation goes back to Schur's lemma. Okay. Schur's lemma tell us, implies that if G, any group, is irreducibly faithful, then uh, every finite subgroup in the center of G is cyclic. Okay. Because the center of G <coughs> Uh, by an irreducible representation, it must be mapped to uh, um, to the circle group by an irreducible representation. And and, uh, and Burnside in 1911. So of course he was aware of this, but he was also aware that this uh, necessary condition is not sufficient. So this necessary condition of 
is not sufficient for G to be irreducibly faithful. Yeah, Burnside, for Burnside, it's G finite. And let me convince you uh, 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 of uh, Burnside's claim. So consider the group, the following group. You take uh, vector space of dimension 2 over S3, and you act on it by uh, the multiplicative group of S3, which acts by scalar multiplication here. Okay, so that's a group of order 18, okay, and it's, it's center free. That's very easy to see. Okay, now G has a quotient of order 2, so G has two uh, reps of degree 1, coming from uh, the cyclic quotient of order 2, but G you see, it has also many more quotients. So each time I take a one-dimensional subspace of this, it's of course invariant by this action, I can kill it. And so you see that G has actually, so you have four one-dimensional subspaces, three plus one. So you have four uh, quotients isomorphic to F3 semi-direct F3 star, which is the same as the symmetry group S3. Right? But S3, we know that it has, we know it's irreducible representation. It has two, uh, it has one uh, irreducible representation of degree two. Okay, so from this we get four e reps of G of degree two. Okay, and that's fine because uh, 18 is 2 plus 4 times 4, so we have all of them. And you see that all these representations kill uh, at least one cyclic subgroup of all the three. Okay, and so, so this is uh, in an appendix of Burnside's book, and then, of course, people were trying to um, find algebra algebraic characterizations of irreducible faithfulness for finite groups and uh, various papers were published already in the 20s. I will not mention all of them, but I, I will mention kind of the end of the story. So this is a theorem due to Gashutz in 54 for the finite groups and an extension in the infinite case is due to Bashir, Becker, and Pierre de la Harpe in 2008. Okay, so let me write. So Gashwitz will be the finite case. So let G be a countable group. And for Gashwitz, it's a finite group. The general case is Becker de la Harpe. then G is irreducibly faithful if and only if for all um, A1 up to AM minimal finite abelian normal subgroups of G, uh, the subgroup that generate fall together, okay, so this is a finite normal subgroup of G, and, and uh, we require that this is generated <coughs> by a single conjugacy class. So as a normal subgroup, is generated by one element. Okay, is the statement clear? What does the mean irreducible faith that the group G is irreducibly faithful? 
G is irreducibly faithful is G as a subset of G is, is irreducibly faithful. So which means that G has an irreducible unitary representation that's faithful. Okay. So what is the minimal? So, so it's minimal among the finite abelian normal subgroups. Yeah. Well, sure. So, I mean, Each one is minimal, uh, and then you take all of them together. Okay, so uh, you can check this in the group, in both sides group. Okay, so what are the minimal finite abelian normal subgroups in that group G here? They are all the cyclic subgroups of order three in G. You have four of them. Uh, all together, they generate this F3 cross F3, and that's not generated by any single conjugacy class. In your theorem, in the uncountable case, is there a counterexample or it is just uh, for convenience? Yes, uh, good question. There is a counterexample. Here it is. So uh, you see that a group that's torsion free, it has no non trivial finite normal subgroup. And so the, 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 this characterization is an empty condition. Okay? Now take an uncountable group whose cardinality, which is abelian and whose cardinality is greater than 2 to the LF naught. Okay, so that's a counterexample. But for the property PN, it, it's uh, like the implications for PN are in contrast. This, uh, yeah, I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot, there I, I need the countability assumption and uh, I, I, yeah, I'm not able to discuss further in the general case. Okay, so <coughs> what are consequences of, of this result uh, related to my story? Certainly one, one of them is the following. So a group G countable is irreducibly faithful if and only if G has Pn for all n. Okay, so one direction is clear all the time, and the other direction, that's a consequence of the becker de Larp statement, because if the group is not irreducibly faithful, we learn from this theorem that this comes from the existence of a distinguished finite normal subgroup of G that has some problem, okay? And so we can take this F, finite set F to be that finite norm. We, yes? You could improve the converse using neutral products. Uh, the converse here. So, the, yeah, uh, I'll possibly, I, I don't know. But I mean, that you take the reducible corresponding finite substance and then take your product. Uh, I'm not able to take the ultra product right away, but. <laughs> so, if this condition does not hold, then you can show that PN fails? In yeah. this condition about no minimal normal subgroups. If there is no minimal abelian finite normal subgroup, then the group is irreducibly faithful automatically. But if there are A1, AM violating this, does it follow that P, yes. M, well, it's not Exactly, yeah. You can deduce this from this, this theorem. You, the set F that, that you can take is that finite normal subgroup. Okay? Because, as a, so this is a finite subset of G, and this one is not, it's irreducibly unfaithful as a consequence of, of this theory. Anyway, so, yeah. So there are other consequences of, of, of this result. For example, in finite groups, so one thing you can learn from this theorem is that if you take a finite group and you model the solvable radical, the largest solvable normal subgroup, this becomes 
and you reduce EB faithful group. Uh, that's a, a rather easy observation. And so in particular, every finite group has an EREP whose kernel is solvable. And uh, also this has an analog in the countable case, but I will not go into that. OK, so let me now move on to abelian groups. And so, so that's the first case where we have extra tools to understand unitary representations. And then, and then already there, we will understand why there are gaps between, uh, 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 between the various ends for, uh, for the property Pn. Okay, so here is the proposition in the abelian case. So G is any abelian group this time. Mm. Then G and N, N is an integer. Then G does not have Pn if and only if uh, G contains a subgroup isomorphic to Cp cross Cp, where P is a prime, which is at most n minus 1. OK, so by this I mean G contains a subgroup, a finite subgroup, isomorphic to the direct product of two copies of the cyclic group of prime order P. OK, so let me prove this for you. So again, one direction, it's clear by Shaw's lemma, right? So if, we, if my abelian group contains that, so that's a non-cyclic subgroup, so uh, something is killed. And what is killed? So I can take a set of size p plus 1 that contains a generator of each of the p plus 1 cyclic subgroup uh, of prime order of Cp cross Cp. And so that set of size p plus 1, it's irreducibly unfaithful. Okay, so G does not have property P, P plus 1, so it cannot have property Pn. Okay, so that's uh, Schur's, Schur's lemma. And so what happens in the other direction? <laughs> So by, by assumption, we find f, a subset of g, of size at most n, which is irreducibly unfaithful. OK, so this implies that for every uh, irreducible representation of G, and G hat denotes the collection of such two equivalents. It's a character, in this case, it's a character, so that's the group of characters. Uh, there exists an element X non-trivial in F, such that pi F, pi X uh, is the identity. Okay. And so let me write this as follows. So the collection of characters is the union over all non-trivial elements of x, of, of f, sorry, of the annihil annihilator of x, the collection of characters that are trivial on x. Okay? But now the key point in this case is that the set of characters is not only a set, it's a group under pointwise multiplication. Okay? So I've expressed a group as a union of proper subgroups, a finite union of proper subgroups. And then you may recall a theorem due to Bargava, which is a neat observation about all groups. So if a group, uh, a group H is a union of less than n proper normal subgroups, if and only if H maps onto Cp cross Cp, where P is prime at most n minus 1. Okay? 
G is commutative here. No. Uh, yeah, G, G is commutative here. H is any group here, but I'm talking about normal subgroups there. Okay. And now, so we see that the, the dual, the contrarian dual of G here, is a union of at most n subgroups. Okay, so from this observation, we conclude that the dual of G maps onto Cp cross Cp. But then the double dual of G contains a copy of Cp cross Cp, and the double dual of G is G. Okay? So is Bargava the group is not necessarily abelian? Bargava, the group is ab absolutely arbitrary, but it's a theorem about normal subgroups. Okay? So you can also ask whether a group can be a union, an arbitrary group can be a union of, of, for example, seven subgroups, exactly seven proper subgroups. It turns out that it's not the case, but that's a, that's a much deeper theorem due to Tomkinson. Okay, so here it's, it's really about uh, normal subgroups. Okay. And now, uh, so now let's uh, let's move on to the general case. And for the general case, I want to discuss one more family of examples. So. P will be a prime, a Q a power, a power of P, and M a non-zero integer. And now let me take W, the M-dimensional vector space over FQ, okay? and V will be the direct sum of copies of W, and how many do I take? I take M plus one copies. Okay. And my group G, which I'll uh, call G sub QM, by definition, it's the semi-direct product of V with GLW acting diagonally. Okay, so that's a finite group. Okay, and what I claim is that GQM has property Pn minus 1, but not property Pn, where n is q to the m plus q to the m minus 1 plus q plus 1. Okay. So why why is this the case? So first of all, uh, we have seen one of these groups before. So G three one. This was Burnside's example. Okay. So why am I uh, claiming this? So you you need to recall. Um, the gashutz becker de la Harpe theorem. Okay, so, uh, in order to understand whether this group is irreducibly faithful of, or not, you have to uh, go through the enumeration of, of all these minimal finite normal subgroups. So, uh, what are these minimal abelian normal subgroups of, of G? They're, it's not too difficult to see that they are contained in V. And so V, I can see it as a G module. And so the minimal abelian normal subgroups are just the simple submodules here. Okay? What is the meaning of N? N is exactly the number of simple submodules. N, this value, is the number of simple uh, ZGQM submodules of V. Okay. So now, 
I have to check whether taking any collection of such min finite minimal normal subgroups, the corresponding normal subgroup is singly generated. So this means that as a module, this module will be cyclic, right? But by the fact I took uh, a number of factors, which is the dimension plus one, I, I happen to have a module that's not cyclic. If I had taken one less summand here, I would get a cyclic module. Okay? So it means that if I ki kill any, any summand in V, which will be a normal subgroup of GQM, this condition is satisfied and get, I get an irreducibly faithful group. But if I don't kill that, the group cannot be irreducibly faithful. And so th this means that every irrep of that group kills at least one of these simple modules. Okay? Now what I can do is I can take a non-zero element in each of these simple submodules, and you have n equals to that number such simple submodules, and this will be a, a subset of G of that size, of size n, which is irreducibly unfaithful. Okay? And so now, I think we are ready for stating the main theorem. The main theorem will tell us basically that this phenomenon that we observed on that specific example of a finite group is essentially the only obstruction. So now let G be a countable group. And n an integer. Um, assume G has property P n minus one, and let F inside G a subset, an irreducibly unfaithful subset of size n. Uh, then I claim the following. If you look at the normal closure, let, let me call it U, the normal closure of F inside G, this is a finite elementary uh, abelian P group for some prime P. In particular, I can view this U as an FPG module. And moreover, I can describe this U as an FPG module as follows. So moreover, there exists W, a finite, simple FPG module, which is of dimension I will call of dimension M over the commutant of G in the endomorphism algebra of, of uh, W. So that's, let me call this K. Uh, such that two things hold, the first thing is that U is isomorphic to a direct sum of L copies of W for some L which is at least N. So I take here at least M plus one copies of W where M is this dimension. And the second point is that N can be expressed as Q to the power M plus q to the power m minus 1, plus q plus 1, where q is the size of k, which is this commutant, the centralizer. Okay, so, so that's k. OK. 
Okay, so uh, okay, so so this result describes the only, essentially the only, irreducibly unfaithful subsets of size n inside groups that have property p n minus 1. And hence, from this you can uh, easily work out an algebraic characterization in terms which we look uh, uh, similar to this of groups that have property p n. Okay, but, but uh, the equality here is of course important because it is so uh, the explanation of p16 plus p61, so corollary. So if a countable, if there exists a countable group g uh, with pn minus 1, but not pn, then n is of this form. Okay, so it's the cardinality of a projective space over a finite field. And so you can go one step further, is that P of zero, which is a tautological statement on any group, implies P of one, which implies P of two, okay? So this is the gelfand rykov theorem, and this is the Walter theorem. Neither one nor two is the cardinality of a finite projective space over a finite field. Okay, and so now I will uh, use uh, the remaining couple of minutes to uh, discuss a variation now. I want to discuss about irreducibly injective sets. So what do I mean by this? So my, my working, my basic definition was this notion of irreducibly faithfulness, which was the property that a non-trivial element gets mapped to a non-trivial operator. Okay? Instead of this, I could use, instead of faithfulness in that sense, I could use the notion of injectivity. Okay? So, uh, say a group G has property Qn, if every set f in G of size at most n is irreducibly injective in that sense. Okay, uh, for every set of size n, I can find some irrep of G whose restriction to that finite set is injective. That's my new concept. So you have a like an square and then the What did you say? No, what, what I was just saying is that, you know, it's obviously related to the previous one. Right? Thank you, thank you, yeah. So, so there is an, one obvious relation is that for any n, p of n choose 2 implies q of n. Right? So that's the quadratic relation that's, that's obvious, right? If you have a set of size n, you can form uh, the, uh, you can choose the qu n, n choose two quotients among them, and this set of n choose two quotients will be irreducibly faithful if and only if the set is irreducibly injective. Okay? So it happens that the converse of this obvious inequality holds for n equals 2, 3, and 4. Okay? But uh, what we observed is that p of 9 is equivalent to q of 5. So, so for n equals 5, it's no longer uh, an implication, uh, which is the reverse of this inequality. And this, we had to use the computer to verify this, unfortunately. 
and let me finish by convincing you uh, that uh, it becomes considerably uh, more uh, complicated to, to study the property Qn rather than P of n, just because there is one extra question involved related to additive combinatorics. So, so if G is uh, a group that's irreducibly unfaithful, if it's unfaithful, then it fails to satisfy property Pn for some n, so it will also fail to satisfy Qn for some n, and so I can define uh, alpha of G to be um, the unique uh, n such that G has Qn minus 1, but not Qn. Okay? There exists, obviously, by definition, such an integer n because I assume g is not uh, irreducibly faithful. Okay? And so, in particular, I want to compute this number for any irreducibly unfaithful group. And so take, for example, g to be cp cross cp. Okay, so that's my prototypical unfaithful group. And then what you discover and again, that's a rather easy observation, is that this is the number alpha p that I was uh, looking for in the open problem that I mentioned in my introduction. So it's the, le it's the least size of a subset of fp times fp. Oh, no, no, I see. I see. Uh, yeah, but what, what is the link with the, the equation where you have equality of p? Ah, no, no, so, so that's, that's a link with my, the, the second part of my introduction. I can, so there is also a link with the first part. So, uh, so I did not formulate precisely what I look, was looking for in characterizing Qn. But one thing you can ask for is, is it true that Qn is equivalent to P of phi of n for some function phi, right? That might be true or not. But now, in order to answer this, Probably I will have to know, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the additive structure of these modules becomes relevant. That's, that's perhaps the point we can make. Okay. I'll stop here. <laughs>